Welcome to IFI's Wildlife of the Garvogue River podcast for Go Fishing Week. Today we have Michael Bell of Nature Learn joining us. Michael is an experienced wildlife educator and involved with the Heritage in School Scheme, Birdwatch, Sligo and other community groups. Tell me about yourself, Michael, and what got you interested in birds, wildlife and the environment? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, well, I grew up in Belfast and, you know, I was always interested in nature from as long as I can remember. I remember enjoying watching David Lapper on TV. And my dad, he wouldn't have been, you know, a hardcore bird watcher or anything, but he always had a pair of binoculars when writing about he'd have a little bird book. And that got me interested from a very, very young age. Um, so I, I got pretty adept, you know, for whatever in my early teens at identifying birds and there's a big interest. And then, of course, as you get to be a, later in your teens, you get interested in other stuff. So it kind of dropped by the wayside a lot. Um, I would always had a kind of be looking at birds here and there, but you're, you know, it wasn't cool to be a bird watcher or anything amongst teenagers. So I kind of hid it a lot. Um, so I say it was always a hobby. It was never a career or anything like that. Just something that was interested, uh, all kinds of nature, but particularly birds. And um, I actually ended up in the U.S. when after I went to university and everything, I uh, just headed off traveling. I was passing through the U.S. I ended up staying for 24 years, so <laughs> it was a long time there. Um, and in the U.S., I did a lot of hiking. You know, I'd go off backpacking maybe on the start of the Appalachian Trail and other trails like that. I started to notice lots of really beautiful little birds around me when you're out in the woods. And I had no idea what they were, so I had to find out what they were, and that really got me hooked again. So I got really back into bird watching in particular when I was in the US. And then I got involved with the Georgia Ornithologic Society. And uh, so, I, I mean, I was... I guess what you'd call a twitcher back then and go chasing rare birds and stuff like that. And uh, But again, it was always just a hobby. Now, while I was in the US, my wife got a job in another part of Georgia, Georgia's estate I was in, and I just so happened to end up inside a big ecological research center there. So uh, I applied to get a job there. I didn't have a degree, in biology degree or anything. So I uh, ended up working there, really, really enjoyed it. But it was always temporary work, you know, because I wasn't qualified or anything. But that first got me involved in working in nature. And then I moved back to Ireland about 13 years ago now. Um, ended up in Sligo just because I thought Sligo looked real pretty. I didn't have a job or anything. So I just went to the part I thought looked the nicest uh, with my wife and my daughter. And uh, then I got into the nature education side of things, I applied for a job with the, the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And it was kind of working in schools with children, which is something I'd never thought about doing in my life, but the job came along. And the more I did that, the more I really, really enjoyed it. So when that contract ended, I decided, well, I enjoy doing this, I'll try doing it for myself. So I set up my own little nature company, Nature Learn. And I do a lot of that, as said, through the heritage and schools, nature education. You wouldn't make a living on your own doing that. So I do a lot of contract work as well during the summer. The last five summers I've been working for Birdwatch Ireland. Uh, and I'm also very involved in the Sligo branch of Birdwatch Ireland too. Actually, the chairperson at the minute. So um, it's a great organisation too. So I've been very, very involved with Sligo branch of Birdwatch Ireland and and in my time and doing nature education, well, I've got more interest in other sides of nature, especially lots of the insects groups like moths, butterflies, dragonflies, but just nature in general, I'd be a lot more kind of all around in the approach to nature rather than strictly bird watching. So. And can you tell us why a river would be a good place to start viewing wildlife? Well, rivers, I mean, they're kind of natural wildlife corridors, just like hedgerows, you know, most of our countryside, it's just open kind of intensive grassland. There's not much uh, space for nature in it. Hedgerows are good. And then a lot of rivers, you know, have kind of uh, tree lines along them. So they're, they're just natural corridors for various birds and bats. And then, of course, lots of wildlife is tied to the water itself. There'd be... Um, Birds like dippers, kingfishers, they nest along rivers. They entirely depend on the river for their food. Uh, 
in the reeds along rivers, you get coots, murhens, grey herons, and then other wildlife um, like otters, mink, you know, you're going to see those along rivers too. And uh, again, dragonflies are a particular interest of mine, and they're basically aquatic insects. Insects they actually spend uh, the vast majority of their life in the water in the larval stage. We only see them flying around. They only live for a few weeks as an adult. So again, uh, there'd be lots of you know water invertebrates you get along rivers too. So. Well, uh, these are some of the things that anglers might see when they're out um, on riversides. Um, what what kind of wildlife would you expect to see on the Garvog at different times of the year? And maybe how does that relate to the different types of fish species there? Well, actually, I mean, the Garvog's a fantastic place for wildlife. And, you know, it's a fantastic opportunity to see wildlife. And I think a lot of people that live in Sligo or visit Sligo, they're walking along the river, but you know they don't notice the, the wildlife that's in there. Um, again, I've seen dippers right in the middle of town. They nest under the bridge by the glass house. You can see them feeding in the river. Real fantastic little birds actually walk under the water, collecting their food. Uh, I've even seen kingfishers in the middle of Sligo. Now, they don't hang around. It's just usually a flash of blue over the water you're getting to look at. Um, and also in towns, when you're in Sligo, that part of the river, um, kind of birds, otherwise, they get kind of uh, used to people being around. So you get fantastic groups of birds like herons. You'll see them feeding away in the river and people just walking past, you know, most people don't notice them, of course. I've even seen otters in the middle of Sligo too. Um, I've seen mink in the middle of town as well. Uh, if I remember one day watching an otter for five minutes right at, beside Stephen Street car park and it was coming up, it would be under the water and it would come up every so often, um, obviously hunting, fishing there, uh, but most people just walked past, they didn't notice it at all. And then also the Gare Vogue, you've got obviously it empties into Sligo Harbour, so you've got a totally different habitat there. And you actually get seabirds will come right into the heart of town up to Key Street there. Birds like Great Northern Divers. So you'd see them in the wintertime off the coast of Ireland, but they're usually, you know, far out to sea. But they'll come right into town. You can get fantastic looks at them. Uh, birds like shags, red-breasted mergansers. And then, um, again, I've seen... Uh, People don't associate seals with freshwater, but I've seen seals up the river. I think they follow the salmon up the river. And I've seen them up as far as Durley Park, and I believe they go they go right up to Lock Gill, the odd time chasing the salmon. Anglers probably don't like them too much, but it's, it's neat to watch them, you know. And, um, and again, you know, when you get out of town, along, there's fantastic kind of uh, woodland there along Durley Park too that's full of wildlife as well and dragonflies and other wildlife. Yeah, that's amazing. The, a good diversity of different habitats right in the town yeah. there. Have you noticed mm -hmm. many changes then to the freshwater habitat over the last few years? Well, I think most of the changes are kind of subtle and, you know, it's not dramatic changes that you're going to notice overnight, but uh, there certainly are changes in the environment. And, you know, I think it's really important to monitor rivers and streams. Um, I know a lot of them, eutrophication is a big problem, you know, runoff from sewage or from fertilizer from farmland. Uh, it can build up the nutrients in the river and really change it. It'll affect the, the invertebrates in there. Like one particular, again, uh, damsel five and have in Ireland is the Irish damselfly, and it's a kind of pretty rare species that we have here. It was first discovered in Ireland, Sligo. Uh, Don Cotton found it in 1981, and it's pretty rare. It's not found in Britain. It is found in parts of Northern Europe too, but it's, it's kind of very important species, you know, for us too. And it's definitely affected, you know, if, if there's a lot of build up from runoff from fertilizers and things like that will affect their habitat. So I think it is very, very important to monitor rivers. And I know groups are doing that now too. The local authority water community's office, they, they're kind of monitoring of the Garavogue and the Tripperties going into Lock Gills too. So. 
And have you noticed any changes that you might think could be due to climate change? Have there been any new visiting species, anything like that? Well, there are new species showing up. Um, my, I, I do believe climate change, I mean, it's, it's an enormous threat and something should be taken really, really seriously. Uh, again, it's hard to, you know, in the short term, you mentioned new species showing up. One species that people associate would uh, would be the little egret, which when I first moved to Slido just 13 years ago, it would have been considered very rare here. But now they're very, very regular. You see lots of them in the bays and uh, along the Garavogue, I've seen them in town too. So it's a bird that's become really, really common, only showed up in Ireland, I think in the 80s down Cork. It spread very, very quickly. People are quick to say that's due to climate change. I'm not so sure. Birds all the time will change, you know, their ranges for no apparent reason. Well, there may be reasons, but not linked to climate change. Like one bird we have in Slide the Noise, incredibly common, you'd take for granted as the colored dove, but it only showed up in Ireland in the 1950s. It just, that was following a big, massive expansion of its range. So, so birds can expand their range out of the blue for various reasons. So, um, whether the, the little egret is due to climate change or not, but obviously the climate warming is going to, to help it, especially if winters get milder. Where you would notice it more is in um, maybe in trees starting to leaf earlier and flowers beginning to come out early in the year. And I think people notice maybe a lot, of, a lot of that's happening a week or two earlier than it used to in the past. And Again, that's going to affect lots of things because insects depend, you know, they have to come out at the right time when the flowers are there. And then birds have to come out at the nest at the right time when there's caterpillars around. So things get out of kilter too quick and it can affect uh, certain animals and groups of animals. So it's something, again, that we need to monitor in the future. And, um, it, you know, obviously climate change is going to be a massive thing going forwards and it's something we need to be very very concerned about yeah um and if, when people are out and about and fishing what are the signs you could look for to show whether um the river is healthy has a healthy ecosystem yeah well, i think um kind of noticing the little insects you generally you know the more variety of little tiny micro invertebrate micro invertebrates you get like You'd, uh, fishermen would notice like pond skaters in the surface of water, whirligig beetles, damselflies, and the more kind of insect the life that is around is a sign that the healthy, the river is fairly healthy. And then also those uh, macroinvertebrates, they're going to feed birds like dippers. And again, having dippers along rivers uh, is a good sign that the river's in, in good shape. Um, Kingfishers have eaten little tiny fish too, again. So, and, that, and that's the tiny fish are food for the bigger fish too. So, again, um, you know, just being aware, of starting with the insect life and, you know, the bird life, that there's a good variety of it, that's a good sign that the, the river's fairly healthy. In Sligo, is there a strong culture of bird watching? Are there many environmental groups in the area? Well, certainly uh, Sligo Bird Watch is a very influential group, very kind of active group. Um, it's been running well, a lot longer than I've been here. I think it probably started in the 1980s, back when Bird Watch Ireland was the Irish Wild Bird Conservancy. It was set up by people like Don Cotton, Martin Enright, Noel Raftery, Trevor Hunter. They've always been involved in Bird Watch and they're still active in Bird Watch today. Um, so it has traditionally been a very big active group and uh, we still are. Um, we have lots of events. Now, of course, the past year with COVID has really knocked us back. We haven't had anything going on at all. But generally, with hopefully when things get back to normal, we'll, we'll start up again. We'd have lots of talks. We do lots of field trips. Usually within Sligo, occasionally we might go up to Donegal or somewhere too. Um, and bird watch, we tend to, although we focus on birds, we kind of, most of us would be interested in other aspects of wildlife. So we've had speakers like Zoe Devlin uh, to talk to the group. She would be you know, a fantastic plant person. Uh, we'd do outings to, especially during the summer when the bird life isn't so uh, 
unusual or whatever. We would do a lot of outings, maybe the woodlands or dune systems, and we'd look at flowers and things too. So it is a very, very active group. Um, I say we're kind of slow now due to COVID, but uh, you can keep up with us. We've got a Facebook page and um, all our events are open to the non members. You don't have to be a member to come to the outings or the talks. Uh, we do encourage people to join Birdwatch, but that's voluntary. So um, best way to keep up with us is through maybe the Facebook page and you'll see when we get things back to normal soon, hopefully, uh, you can follow us and find out what events are going on. So that would be a good way to, to get started and get involved. Have you any other tips for anyone who wants to start bird watching or just learning more about their local environment? Yeah, um, good thing about nature, like if you get interested in nature, you're never going to get bored. And the other thing that's right on your doorstep, you don't have to travel, you know, to another country to find it. You could, if you're interested in birds or nature in general, just start, start with your back garden. Uh, notice the birds that are coming there, maybe put up bird feeders and make your back garden kind of wildlife friendly. Start to notice what insects, butterflies, other things that are showing up. You'll not be able to maybe identify everything when you're starting out, but that, that's okay. Just enjoy what you can. And um, and again, you can join groups like Bird Watch. You'll meet other people from beginners to experts. You know, and it's, you know you'll learn quickly from other people. And also now, you know, through Facebook and other things, there's lots of information out there. Uh, maybe you'll take a picture of an insect. You don't know what it is. You can go on to various Facebook groups and you can find experts to tell you almost anything. I know. In, in Ireland, there's a group on Facebook, they're called Insects and Vertebrates Ireland. And they have a lot of people on there. You can post pictures, anybody can, and you know they'll identify them for you. Again, if flowers are what you're getting interested in, Zoe Devlin, again, has a Facebook page, Wild Flowers of Ireland. You can post a picture of flowers and she's really, really good. If she knows what it is, she'll tell you. If, if she doesn't, she's... So he's very good about it too. So again, just starting locally in your garden, your neighborhood, noticing what's around you, it's a good way to get started. Obviously, if you're into bird watching, you know, a cheap pair of binoculars and a, a bird book, a basic bird book, was about the only equipment you need really. And then it's, it's just getting outside and enjoying nature from there. So there's lots of resources available. And what do you think we could do maybe to help our river ecosystems or to become more sustainable? Well, I think it kind of it kind of starts with being aware and appreciating our rivers, you know, and kind of, I think that's the first step is just, like I say, appreciate that they're there. And if you appreciate them and are aware of them, you're a lot more likely to work towards protecting them in the future. So that's where I think education is so, so important. And, um, you know, to start in the schools with children, obviously, and get them interested in nature. And I do think the primary schools are doing really a lot of good work now too through heritage and schools. I sometimes feel maybe secondary schools are too much exam orientated, you know, and studying from textbooks, you know, I wish, that's where I think we need to get kids really out into nature because that's where you start to lose them when they get to be teenagers. And even, you know, I've talked to people at third level doing environmental subjects and they say they do very, very little, or some of them, it depends, you know, what course you're on, but um, some of them seem to do very, very little actual field work, you know, it's all from textbooks and things. So I think, again, um, you know, the more we pick, make people aware and appreciative of what's around us, the more likely people are obviously to, to want to take care of it in the future. Yeah, and fisheries do a Something Fishy um, primary school program and do field trips as part of that as well. It is important yeah, yeah. Um, uh -huh. for education. And finally, Michael, um, are there any upcoming projects or events um, that would benefit the wildlife in the area that you know of? Uh, there's obviously always little projects going on. Again, through uh, Slag of Birdwatch, you can find out a lot of information or just generally through Birdwatch Ireland, 
for interest, if you're interested in birds, they do a garden bird survey every winter. It's just finished for this year, but uh, next winter people will be able to take part in that. And you don't have to be an expert. It's just if you can identify the most common birds in your garden, you can take part in that. All the instructions are online. You're just basically recording the birds coming to your garden every week throughout the winter. Uh, again, the, uh, there's a countryside bird survey that Birdwatch Ireland run. That's uh, a little more involved. You'd have to know your bird song fairly well. But, you know, once you get to learn that, then you can get involved in that. Again, the Sligo branch, we would do counts in the winter time of the birds that visit the bays and the estuaries. Anybody can come along. You don't have to be an expert. You will you'll be working with people that are good at identifying the very shore birds and things. So, um, and then there's always little projects that going on through the National Biodiversity Data Center. Uh, they've got a fantastic website. And again, anybody can record biodiversity through that website. Say you've got a particular interest in butterflies, you can go on there and record what butterflies are in your garden, in your area. Uh, I've mentioned a particular interest in dragonfly, and I'm actually been doing, I started last year doing a Sligo dragonfly survey. I have a special Facebook page set up for that, where I'm trying to get records of dragonflies all over the county. So again, maybe you might not know the name of the dragonfly, but if you can get a picture of it and send it to me, you know, uh, very often we'll be able to identify it. Um, and those records will contribute to a national uh, dragonfly atlas that's going on over the whole country too. So there are kind of various little projects that you can follow on again, you know, if you kind of get a particular interest in something, you know, you can really add a lot of records to our, our databases and things. So. That's very good. Look, thank you again, Michael, for a very interesting chat on freshwater uh, wildlife. And if anyone wants to listen back to this interview, you can on you can view it on IFI's YouTube channel, where Michael has provided some beautiful pictures of some of the wildlife, birds and insects and fish discussed today. And Michael's website, naturelearn.com, has lots of information on wildlife and some great pictures too. Thank you again, Michael. Uh, thanks very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And Michael, I've um, speaking to anglers that do their own fly tying. They've told me that they use a wide range of bird feathers, mallard duck, teal duck, moorhen, even pheasants, crow, starling and badger hair for fly tying. Are these, would you find these things on the Garvogue? Oh, yeah, you'd find a lot of that in the Garvogue and, you know, all of it within Sligo. Um, certainly there'd be plenty of mallards, there's moorhens, coots along the river, and the anglers would probably come across the feathers from, you know, pretty regular from time to time. Um, and the other teal would be, in, certainly in Sligo, they would, wouldn't be as obvious along the Garvogue, but you'd get them in the reeds out in Loch Gill. And you know, so there's plenty of badgers around too. If you know where badgers are maybe crossing under a fence somewhere, that's a good place to get the, the hair from badgers too. But yeah, and pheasants are very, very widespread. So all those birds, you know, with a bit of luck, you should be able to come across their feathers at some stage, I would think.